children's work. So the boring admin stuff to start off with, um, we will be recording uh, the presentation. Um, we're asking people to turn off their videos and microphones just to try and keep the platform as stable as possible um, and keep the connection strong, if that's okay. Um, if you click on speaker view in the top right hand side of your screen, this will allow you to um, see the speakers more clearly. Um, and there will be the opportunity for questions at the end. So if you can use the chat function um, to send in any questions, or if you want to do it privately, that's absolutely fine too. Just select me, so Kate Cavell, and then I'll receive your questions. And at the end, um, I can um, pitch those at our speakers. So I'm delighted to um, introduce today's uh, speakers. So firstly, um, to welcome Isabel Eaton, who is story writer and gatherer at Hope and Homes for Children, who will be the interviewer for today's webinar. She will be joined by Stefan Darabus, who is Hope and Homes for Children's Director of Programs and has worked for Hope and Homes for 22 years. So I think we've got a lot of experience in the room here today. Um, he has very extensive experience, obviously, in deinstitutionalization and systemic transformation in childcare and the management of childcare systems. Finally, Kyle Nevin is a partner at Allen & Overy based in our Dubai office and saw firsthand the work of Hope and Homes for Children um, back in 2019 when the world was a very different place, um, when both Kyle and I were lucky enough to visit Stefan and see the work in Romania. And I'm sure Kyle will, will agree with me that it was a really inspiring and humbling experience. Mm. And thank you again, Stefan, for hosting us and for giving us such an amazing um, a few days. It was, a, it was a, one, of, one of the experiences I'll take with me. So thank you so much for that. It was a pleasure. Thank you. Um, so as we know, for children in vulnerable families, coronavirus is not just a health crisis. It really places them at urgent risk of losing their loving homes and childhoods to the neglect of an orphanage. Children already confined to orphanages are facing increased levels of abuse, harm and infection due to staff shortages. During this session, we'll find out about the impact coronavirus has had on Hope and Homes for Children's countries of operation, how the different country teams have managed and are adapting to support vulnerable children and their families, and why Hope and Homes for Children is best placed to help the most vulnerable children and families through this crisis. So without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Isabel. Thank you, Kate, and thank you, Kyle and Stefan, for joining us today. Um, Kyle, um, starting with you, through ANO's partnership with Hope and Homes for Children, you were taken to see uh, our work in Romania. During that trip, you were taken to an orphanage for children with disabilities. Can you just tell us something about what stays with you from that particular experience? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, uh, I mean, a few things stayed with me through that experience. I think it, it was honestly absolutely shattering. Um, I think, you know, I, I had been under the sort of misapprehension that an orphanage was a sort of charming Dickensian institution with sort of a, a bunch of um, young children jauntily singing songs and, you know, living their life, albeit under sort of suboptimal conditions. But it, it wasn't that at all. Um, I think when um, kind of Kate asked me what I felt at the time, having just come out, I, I used the, the phrase human storage. And it, it really feels like that. It was, you know, I think that the term neglect is, is exactly right. The, the degree of neglect, I think, stays with me more than anything. You know, seeing people that are really, you know, really desperate in terms of uh, the, the needs and the, the requirements they have to, to live a sort of a, a healthy, normal life, um, just literally abandoned with nothing more than a, a roof over the head and, you know, food to, to keep, them, uh, keep them going. It was crushing, honestly. And what often strikes people, particularly when they visit um, institutions in Eastern Europe, is it's not necessarily the physical conditions, because sometimes these institutions are very hospital-like, they can be almost overheated and so on, um, but it's more about the emotional neglect and the, the lack of any interaction. Is that something that, that you... Yeah, yeah. <laughs> It, it, it struck me more because the, the sort of the physical environment was, you know, fine, you know, clearly not sort of luxurious, but, you know, there was sort of art on the walls um, and, you know, fresh coat of paint. So it had all the trappings of, of a place that, you know, children could be comfortable, but the, the, the lack of care in the sense that there was sort of 
one or two nurses looking after dozens of, of people looking after in the loosest possible sense because you know looking after dozens of people um, in rooms where you know they may not have been talked to or addressed or um, interacted with at all during the day other than you know the supply of food and, and bathing which you know was quite shocking to me frankly. What was the range, the sort of age range of the uh, the children and people who were being, um, in inverted commas, cared for uh, there? Yeah. A, a, a huge range. I mean, from from very young. Um, and again, I think what what stayed with me was that that people had spent you know the bulk of or nearly their entire life in this institution. You know, and and essentially in the same bed in the same room, with you know seeing maybe one or two other people for years um which is you know, nightmarish i guess but i mean it was a very broad age range from you know very young infants through to um you know people in their sort of you know, late late 20s essentially but um that have been in the institution for their entire sort of teenage and, and adult life and as i'm i'm sure you um you know discovered in the course of that uh, that journey when we're working to close institutions like that, a, a massive part of that is trying to reunite children um, with existing families by supporting those families and building new families through fostering. But also important um, key to it all is what, what we call family type homes. And um, I think in the course of your visit, you went to see uh, one of those um, services. Could you, could you describe what that was like and how it differed from, from the institution? <laughs> The contrast, again, and um, sort of a massive contrast from the institution. I mean, the institution is sort of a you know, sort of monolithic uh, creation with a, a bunch of rooms with sort of beds, people left in, and, and that was that. I think the, the family type home, and I think, you know, probably family home is a better uh, name for it. I think if I, I didn't understand the, the backstory of, of the place, and, you know, if I just walked in off the street, I would have just told you, yeah, this is just a, a family that happens to have a lot of kids, um, you know, relative to that's my family. But, uh, you know, the, the, um, the environment was essentially like I would expect any family, normal family home um, to, to be in that, you know, there were kids that had, you know, their own sort of artwork and, and you know, passions on the walls. They were interacting with each other. You know, they had created a sort of a friendship network, um, you know, among what, what were essentially sort of siblings or um, you know, siblings within the, the house. Um, it, it was essentially sort of indistinguishable largely from a, you know, true family home, um, which, you know, as a contrast to the, the institution was really stark. Um, Another um, sort of key point about um the family homes is that there's a limit on the number of children uh, up to 12 and then also a much much higher ratio uh, of staff to children what did you observe about the relationship between the carers and the and the children there yeah it, it, it was sort of more familial in the sense that um you know th there were sort of personal relationships between the um the carers and the the children um and it's certainly not present in the institution where it was sort of, you know, staff looking after, um, you know, people that, that were sort of left there rather than, you know, the, the, the carers in the family home um, knew what the, the children were up to at school. They, you know, knew what their hobbies were, sort of, you know, intro them to, to performing sort of a musical number. They were baking together. It, it felt like a real family. The, the degree of interaction was, you know, like, like any, you know, good, frankly, any other, any good family uh, interaction. And, you know, I, I honestly wouldn't have been able to pick um, that it was sort of a, a professional sort of care relationship um, if I hadn't known that going in. Um, it, it, you know, I suppose lack of family photos on the walls, but otherwise uh, it was sort of indistinguishable <laughs> from a, uh, you know, a, a sort of a really strong family environment. And also the location of the homes is important too, because often the institutions are very um, isolated from, uh, you know, the town or the community. Uh, but the family homes are, you know, on suburban streets. They're they're in in um, a, a proper part of the community. Is that something you kind of sensed when you were there as well? 
Yeah, I mean, frankly, it was beautiful property that we visited. Um, but yeah, the, the kids sort of went to school. There were sort of other kids down the road that they could, um, you know, play with, interact with. Uh, it, it was embedded in the community, um, which, again, stark contrast to the institution of sort of walled off and, and miles away. Um, and, you know, the, the only interaction you have is with someone that's essentially in the cell next to you. Um, which is you know, pretty hard to, to see. Uh, mm -hmm. And so um, looking back on that now, what, what's your sort of lasting impression um, of the work and the experience of visiting the program in Romania? Um, yeah, I suppose it's hard to summarize into a, a sentence, but I think the, the, um, the, the thing that I really took away from particularly the, the small group homes was the sense of hope that I felt and, you know, among the, the children and they had sort of individual, you know, dreams and, and interests and, you know, they, they aspire to sort of a, a broader life. And, I, you know, I, I found that so encouraging because the institution, there is, you know, there is no, it's truly hopeless. And people sort of bandy that sort of phrase around willy nilly, but, you know, to, to see a, a true dead end in the life of someone where, you know, the, the be all and end all is, is in this room um, is devastating, um, truly. And to, to see sort of children taken from, from that environment where th there's nothing more than existence for another day into a place where, you know, they have hobbies, they have dreams, they have friends, they have, you know, uh, true relationships with others. And to see the, the sort of the light switched on in, in their eyes as they're sort of excited to share that and, and share these things with, with us as, as visitors and share, you know, the things that they, they've done and seen and were interested in and, you know, collected and show you your, you know, the things on the wall, like, like any other sort of, um, you know, kid in, in some random house in, in suburbia. Uh, it, it was such a contrast and it, it shows just how important and how powerful the work that, that Hope and Homes is doing um, you know, in Romania around the world, I guess. Thank you very much, Kyle. I'm going to chat to Stefan for a bit now, and then I know you've got some questions of your own for him, so we'll make sure we leave some time for that at the end. Thank you. Um, Stefan, um, an incredible year uh, for our teams on the ground. Could you just um, sketch for people how uh, children and families who are already um, struggling have been affected by the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic? Hello. Um, yes, of course. Um, um, I would want to start by saying thank you to Alan and Aubrey and to the representatives who are today with us, uh, wanting to know a bit more about what we've done with, with their support, with your support. Um, there are most uh, dramatic situations for the children and families we are here to serve, and ba they basically stem from the poverty. And this is most obvious now in the middle of the crisis we are going through because this medical crisis caused by COVID-19 is has turned actually into a humanitarian crisis. Um, thousands, hundreds of thousands of families are about to break apart and the lives of children actually mean shortages, poverty, uh, uncertainty and disease. With this pandemic, and this is something that not only us Open Homes and Children say, but there are also um, international organizations and um, poll, polling authority who say that the number of children living in extreme poverty increases exponentially. Um, and the COVID-19 pandemic brings about losses in human lives, medical, economical crisis with effects on the whole society, but especially on the poorer ones on the marginalized communities on the vulnerable populations which are single parent families um, families with many children or young care leavers those who see their independent living uh, potential and future severely diminished so basically poverty is one of the most severe problems of the children we work with um, those in marginalized families in addition to those in institutions are exponentially more affected by, by the uncertainty brought by the pandemic, the lack of food, the lack of accommodation, the lack of minimum, minimum hygiene conditions. And basically this crisis, this medical crisis, throws us back in the past 
with millions of, of children and families forgotten in poverty, despair, and needs, because basically very few people or authorities have the time and the energy and the focus to think about them and to intervene in this respect. Isabel, you're on mute. Sorry. And so in those situations, obviously the risk of children being separated from their families and institutionalized is higher, but also what's the impact on children in institutions during a, a crisis like this? They are even more isolated than they uh, have been uh, previously and uh, they are stuck. We are not allowed to interact with them. Our colleagues in countries of operations are, are not uh, uh, allowed to interact because of quarantine, which is established basically in all um, um, services, uh, child protection systems or, or social services related to larger groups of uh, beneficiaries, be them children or, or adults. So it is more and more difficult to work with them on the one hand. On the other hand, there is one positive consequence of, uh, of uh, the pandemic, which is a strengthening of the relationship between children in institutions and staff, members of staff who look after them, because they are stuck together. For the first time, uh, the members of staff in institutions have had to spend one full week, two full weeks, uh, staying there, not being allowed to leave uh, the orphanages, and therefore uh, having continuous contact with the children in institutions. And in this respect, what we have as feedback is that their relationships have developed stronger, uh, they, they grew stronger, and um, the members of staff came out and told us that actually what they found was um, a totally different um, child that they had previously seen in, in either one or the other. And their opinions about the children in institutions changed and uh, the way in which they have, uh, you know, their affection uh, uh, exposed to the children in institutions is, is stronger as well, which is the only, I would say, positive consequence of the COVID-19 pandemic. Another negative consequence is uh, that of uh, hurried uh, reintegrations. So in some situations, state authorities trying to decrease the number of children in institutions, do it forcefully, do it rapidly uh, by placing children back into their own families without sufficient monitoring, without sufficient preparation. And unfortunately, in some situations like these, children end up in, in uh, even stronger um, uh, circumstances of vulnerability because we are not sure what would happen with them there back home where they have uh, a lot of uh, 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 poverty and, and lack of uh, material goods or food or, or hygiene um, items to, to use. So we'll see what happens in this respect. This is another negative effect of the pandemic. And in, in a way, that kind of um, rushed and unplanned reintegration is just a form of abandonment. But it's also quite dangerous for the whole progress with DI because it does give ammunition to people to say, oh, well, this doesn't work. Look what happens when you send these children home. I would say that basically, um, unfortunately, the media and the public communication, the public agenda is so full of uh, what happens with uh, the businesses, with the employees, with uh, um, those who work for state authorities, those who lose jobs, that the issues of children in institutions or children in state uh, protection is not necessarily high up on the agenda. This is just another example of the way in which society is not prepared to deal with such um, high magnitude consequences of uh, the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, it's, it's just a fact. So it is true what you say, but I would say that um, these problems are going to be fixed very soon, as soon as state authorities, social services realize and, and regional uh, county councils or town halls realize the kind of, um, um, you know, danger they may place the children into. But these are uh, some examples and other examples are related to the even harsher marginalization of, of the marginalized communities, isolated communities. What we see in some of our country programs is how very poor communities are even more isolated than they used to be. The, they are even more detached from the society per se. 
most of them uh, had jobs by day, daily jobs. They don't necessarily have long-term uh, employment opportunities. So what they do is they go in the morning and try to find jobs for that particular day or for that week in an informal way. What we see more and more is that these people are unable to find uh, these uh, um, spontaneous jobs, to put it this way. So therefore, the amount of income that they have for themselves and their own families is even less than what it used to be, which is quite, quite catastrophic. It is catastrophic for, for these people, for these communities. This is why the UN considers that the current pandemic will lead us to a new wave of uh, poverty worldwide and all the indicators related to poverty reduction, be them in, in uh, you know, the European Union or the UN, are going to fall to pieces. And do the families that your teams are working with have the information they need to cope with this crisis, even just to stay safe? Well, what we do is we try to, to talk to them as much as we can, be them directly or indirectly. Just to give you a few examples, our teams from India and Nepal, where we know that Alan and Aubrey is supporting our work so strongly, uh, and also our wider programmatic work, um, they, they've done 93 reunifications from ASHA orphanage um, and, and unfortunately this continued to be postponed. Uh, the project uh, is in contact with the parents so therefore we talk to them, we keep communication with them but we are unable to, to directly go to them uh, uh, with the children from the ASHA orphanage. What I want you to know is that quite a lot of our colleagues in country programs uh, have got uh, COVID and got over it. We've even got social workers who've got COVID infection twice because of the contact they continue to have with the children and families. What they say is that they cannot stay apart, especially at these times of such critical hardship for those we are here to serve. Uh, also in Nepal, uh, there are some practical actions we take to minimize the impact on children and carers as much as we can in terms of direct support, hygiene support, uh, uh, basic uh, goods support, which we go and offer to them as much as we can. And uh, uh, we try to monitor as much as we can the general situation in conditions of, of a dynamic um, changing environment from country to country. There is one situation in India and Nepal, there is another one in South Africa, there is another one in Europe. So it depends on where we go, what we do and, and how we can actually be as close as possible to, to the children and families and those in orphanages and institutions. Can, can you tell us a little bit about that, say, in, in relation to Romania, in the early days of the crisis, because the team's work relies on having this close connection with the children, with the families, how did they reorganise? What new methods have they been able to employ? How have they managed to get round these incredible hurdles to carry on providing that support? We, we brought some, some common, decent, basic rules of distance so basically, no masks, no contact without masks. We also, because, because of our uh, um, quite, quite high profile, we got approached by, by companies and we dispersed to the children and families and those in institutions, those we work with, 200,000 masks. And, um, and we gave them to those we, we know are in a situation of impossibility of buying their own masks. And, and we keep distance. For instance, one example is that we go to the threshold, to the limit of the property, and we stay there, be it the door of the uh, apartment or the fence of, uh, of the little house they have, and we leave the goods there. Uh, this is one example, and, and we talk from a distance. Another example is that we use for marginalized communities, our colleagues from uh, social services, be them local level or county level, and we use their logistical uh, possibilities of this, uh, you know, uh, dispersing the goods and, and the support we are here to offer, either through the gendarmerie or through their own staff who are able to go and, and uh, uh, take these goods into those communities. 
we use phones, but to a certain extent, because a lot of those we work with do not necessarily have phones because they cannot afford to pay for, for, for a phone. Um, so these are some of the ways in which we work. They keep coming to us, to our offices, because they know where we are. They got used to the fact that they cannot come in any, any, any longer. We used to have an open door policy and we will have it once this pandemic is over. But for now, these are some of uh, the ways in which we, we try to support them. Also, the use of open letters. We sent open letters to state authorities. Uh, provided some some um, uh, solutions to them in terms of supporting the most vulnerable uh, people and families. We told them that they should allocate a monthly uh, basic income to those who are in an impossibility to have income because otherwise those children would suffer from poverty, not, not only poverty, hunger, cold, uh, lack of access to education and so on and so forth. Some state authorities took in, into account these uh, observations of ours, some others didn't. Uh, in some situations, they, they are to be found in uh, the way in which European Union funding is going to be used in countries like Romania and Bulgaria. But I would say that these are the more positive examples. Uh, there are others which are pretty messy, to put it quite clearly, such as our environments in India, in Nepal, in South Africa, or in even other countries in Europe, such as Moldova or, or Transnistria or Bosnia-Herzegovina, which do not benefit from the support of uh, the European Union. And so um, in terms of actually directly uh, supporting families, technology, which has come to you know, the, the rescue of so many of us isn't necessarily that much of an answer on the ground? To be an answer on the ground, it has to be now and quick, which is almost impossible. It has to be, you know, the, the kind of technology you need to disperse is by, by millions. We have dispersed as much as possible uh, technology to those uh, children we work with so that they can have online schooling and, and distance education. Uh, it is definitely something really worth trying to do. It is something we suggested uh, the county councils and the governments to, to allocate funding for, to ensure that the, the children in, vul in vulnerable communities and in, in institutions have access to such technological means so that one, they could stay connected to, to, to schools by uh, distance learning, and two, they can have access to to either their extended family or to or we could have access to them so that we can ensure continuous communication but these things do not happen from from one day to another they take time unfortunately um i also meant really uh that you know i think i understand that in, the teams have had to rely a lot on telephone counseling that you know there isn't the possibility in many yes, households yes. to do things on whatsapp or, or so on but they have been trying really hard to provide that psychological support that you know all families frankly um, could do with right now to, to keep to keep things um, calm and stable for children. Can, can you talk a bit, little bit about how that's worked in, in say a country like Moldova? In terms of uh, uh, Moldova they are one of the very good examples in this respect because they've been able to keep in touch with, with their um, uh, beneficiaries in this way with the families they work with our colleagues from other countries do the same. They try to have phone contact with, with the families we work with, uh, with the young adults living institutions, especially at a time when domestic violence increases, there is increasing tension, there are increasing um, um, feelings of anxiety, frustration, uh, um, depression find its way, finds its way not only with children, but also with, with adults, with, with families in, in our prevention programs or in our reintegration programs. So trying to support in this, in this respect, just talking, just having a means of communication with them is indeed essential. And um, what about children uh, with disabilities who have been reunited with their families, particularly in places like Rwanda, where there's been really great success with that pioneering work. How are the team able to give them or ensure they receive the, the extra support that they need at a time like this? They do it. They do it because, because they are there to do that. So as I said, I, I think that one of the most moving things about our colleagues, uh, wherever they work, in whatever country uh, geography they are, 
is the dedication they have for, for the children and families they are there to, to work with. And uh, the fact that they continue to go to visit, to, to even, even from a distance to talk to them, see how they are, what they need, um, how they could be of help is, is quite a testament of their dedication. And uh, we tried to see if they were, because you, of course you want to protect your staff and you want to protect your colleagues, social workers, psychologists, we, we wanted to see if there was any way to stop the way in which we work directly with, with the children, with, with the families. And we couldn't do that. They simply said, look, it's, it's, it's not moral to do it now when they need us most. So the only place where we could keep a distance between our staff, our colleagues and the children is where there was a quarantine imposed formally by state authorities, either in terms of some, you know, orphanages, institutions, or, or family type homes. But in other contexts, we've been able to keep in touch with, uh, with the children and the families. Can you give us an idea what's happened to the planned activities across Open Homes for Children's work that would um, normally have happened, you know, without this extraordinary uh, new challenge this year? Well, some of our work has been a bit maybe stalled, but um, we've been quite surprised to see that our, our work goes on. I mean, we do not stop implementing our work. Uh, in, uh, it's, it's quite interesting to see how, for instance, in South Africa, um, we work on, on the closure of free institutions and uh, we've had some, some nearly 300 children reunified. Uh, we've had over 500 families um, uh, where we supported them to stay together, parents and children. Um, we continued with the assessment of uh, the uh, children to be transited from institutions and we managed to assess close to 500 children so that we can transit them when, as soon as possible when the quarantine is over from institutions into, into other uh, family-like alternatives. So work goes on. It is a bit more difficult, it is a bit more challenging, but uh, this is not something that would stop us from, from doing what we do. We've managed to find quite innovative ways of interacting with, with our uh, beneficiaries. We do even more increased work with our colleagues from state authorities, uh, social workers, psychologists, carers, educators, nurses. So what we see now is a very, um, I would say, dynamic way of uh, uh, co-working between our staff in, in, in Hope and Homes to Children and our partners in state authorities in addition to the families they, they work with, our colleagues. Sorry Stefan, can you still hear me? Yes. Okay, I'm having trouble hearing you. I don't know if that's true for anybody else. I'm going to assume it's just my end, so I'll, I'll carry on. Yeah. Um, one thing that really struck me when the pandemic first happened, I was thinking about children in institutions who had been um, ready to, to be reunited with their families or had been matched with um, a foster family. And I thought, my God, how devastating that that's all now going to come to an end. But it was so inspiring to learn that actually, you know, after the initial crisis, that didn't come to an end. And that we still have managed in places like Bosnia and so on to carry on with the reintegrations. Obviously, things have been slower and there's been lots of care taken, but it's incredible that the teams have managed to keep the momentum going for, for those children as well. Um, you know, they say that you know a friend uh, when, you need, when you need a friend most at a time of crisis. I think that in the same way, you know, uh, an organization and people who say they are there to support you at a time of crisis like this one, if they stand by you. Uh, we are not, we're not an organization who does talking, we're an organization who does real work on the ground at the grassroots level with the families, uh, with the children in institutions, uh, in, in vulnerable communities. And this is when we need to prove it most. Um, but at the same time, the kind of work we do with Alan and Aubrey, for instance, on the development of a, digit, of a digital tool um, uh, is, is quite, quite relevant for us in, in India, in Nepal. You know that we are working together on developing a digital tool for our partners, Chini, in India. And the tool is going to provide quite crucial support for the care workers and the community. And the aim of this um, is to help to support gatekeeping mechanisms and allow easy access 
to simplify child protection policies and guides. This is the kind of blend between our traditional way of working on the ground and the new innovative ways of, of mixing um, the traditional way of working with the new conditions of the world we live in. That um, overlaps slightly with, with my um, final question really, which is how do you see Hope and Homes for Children's work um, developing in the recovery from the pandemic? Because as Kate mentioned at the start, we're now really coming to understand the enormous scale of the secondary impact of the pandemic. Oh, I, I think that for us, um, what happened over the last year has been pretty traumatic in terms of uh, impact, not for us necessarily, but for the children we are here to serve. It's quite, quite painful to see what happens uh, with so many families who are poor and they, then they grow poorer, with so many children whose uh, future is uncertain and then it gets even more uncertain. So this is something that only pushed us. We, we were, it's not to say that we were in a sort of a comfort zone because it would be wrong. I think a, an organization like ours cannot be in a comfort zone ever. What you see is always something that takes you out of the comfort zone. But now more than ever, we've been forced to think out of the box and to think of, of doing ways in the most unexpected possible uh, 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 you know, variances and ways you could think of. And this is what we've done. This is how we've managed to adapt and adjust to the new world we live in. And I think this is going to stay for us from now on as well. And if we had procedures and protocols and certain ways of doing things and you know, uh, good practices, now all these things have increased to a totally different level, which keeps innovation and uh, you know, trying to, to, to do research for, for new ways of doing things high up on the agenda. At the same time, I want to end by saying that nothing will replace the real contact with people and families. Nothing will replace our work on, on grassroots level, or, or, you know, going out in the field. These cannot be changed in the, in the DNA of an organization like ours because we are about direct contact between children and families and, and, and children institutions and the members of staff in state authorities and our partners. And this is what we need to do. We are on the front line and I think we are going to continue to be on the front line no matter what. Thank you very much, Stefan. Um, I'm going to hand um, over to Kyle now because I know he has some questions of his own, um, you know, following on from uh, his Romania visit. Yeah, thanks, Isabel. I actually, I've got one sort of following on from um, from Stefan's last answer. Um, I, I mean, the the sort of virus so far has taken a bit of a sledgehammer to how um, governments, uh, organisations, institutions have have operated across the world. Um, I mean, I'm sort of like I suppose most on the call, desperate for some good news coming out of uh, 2020. So uh, the the question I had was, you mentioned a couple of and and it find relatively potentially minor things compared to the, the challenges that you've been facing and overcoming um, in the face of the pandemic. But is there anything in the nature of the societal change um, and the, the sort of effects of um, the, the virus on society more generally that may um, you may be able to leverage to, to help uh, the work that home, Homes for Children are doing? I'm thinking of things like the like the universal basic income that you mentioned that, that may become you know more of a normal feature or governments may become more comfortable with it you know the the idea that uh, carers and institutions are more, more familiar with the types of relationships that they need to form is, is there anything in the pandemic that gives you cause for hope um i i would say that one issue which is definitely going to stay on the agenda for us is that of social housing what has become clear uh, over the last few months is that we can talk about education, we can talk about access to health, you know, we can talk about a lot of things, but if people do not have a roof above their heads, it will be a disaster for them and for their own children. So, so that for us has become a priority to see how we can actually expose to governments the need they have to develop social housing, which is a very, very low percentages from the total stock of housing in the countries where we're working. So this is an essential element for us to continue to, to, to build on. Uh, I would say that, that what 
the last few months got more on the agenda is the level of poverty that these countries still have, the number of people who live under uh, uh, you know, the limit of uh, poverty in the countries where we are present, because they usually want to keep their eyes closed. They want to avoid seeing these things. They want to talk about anything else, piping systems, tarmac on the roads, because this is what brings them votes. And whether we like to admit it or not, politicians and decision makers will think about who votes for them. Uh, so basically trying to, to make them understand that if they do not have the next generation of children, because the, what we see is that, uh, um, you know, there, is, there are less and less children in the countries where we are working. If they do not want to, to have their nations die and, and just go out, they'll have to invest in children, whether they are poor or rich. Uh, there is a lot of nationalism, not only that, but also chauvinism and uh, extremism, I would say. Uh, there is very much a sort of, a, of an anti-lefty -left, uh, speech saying that if you, if you are in favor of a, a minimum basic income, you are suddenly a socialist, which is deeply wrong. Because what we talk about, of course, is not suffocating private initiative and entrepreneurship, but actually allowing children to have a life and to have food and clothing and, and heating and electricity to, to be able to learn and to study and to read that. That's all. It's, it's what minimum basic income would actually provide. So in addition to social housing, indeed, the, the element of minimum basic income is going to become something relevant for us in terms of policy and advocacy. I think that's at least something um, to, uh, to to hope for uh, coming out of this. I, I mean, the, the other thing perhaps we discussed as we're, we're driving around Romania was was the relationships that Hope and Homes has with um, some of the other sort of either NGOs or charities around the world. Could could you say something about how your um, collaboration w with others has changed as a result of the um, as a result of the virus? Well, it only grew better. It only grew stronger. Um, what, what we do as an organization is try to leave aside this uh, competitiveness, bad competitiveness among uh, charities, non-governmental organizations, because in our field, it's about resources. It's about who has access to those resources. And this, in some situations, manages to, to uh, leave out communication and dialogue and constructive uh, uh, conversations. So what we do is, is we come as close as possible to those charities, those non-governmental organizations who are on the same um, uh, agenda with us, trying to do the same things, uh, trying to fight for children with disabilities, children in institutions, wanting them out into family environments, families who are at the verge of breakout, and, and children, uh, you know, uh, being abused and so on and so forth. So these are the kind of gen NGOs and alliances of NGOs we come close to, we get into, and, and try to in increasingly create a common language together with them. Because what we see is that our stakeholders, be it in the EU or in the UN or whatever other international bodies, uh, relevant stakeholders, decision makers you talk about, what they want is not individual organizations. They want umbrella organizations. They want to talk to fewer people who represent more charities and non-governmental organizations rather than the other way around. Thanks, Stefan. Um, Isabel, did you want, or Kate, did you want to open up to the uh, the floor? Yeah, happy to open up to the floor. Um, thank you both for um, a really inspiring insights into how um, the virus is affecting your work. And um, it's, it was lovely to hear you, Carl, reflect back on the trip. It seems like years ago, but in many ways, when you start remembering it, it, it feels really like it was a few weeks ago as well. So it's really, I appreciated the opportunity to personally reflect as well. Um, so just um, a few questions have come in. So. Um, Here's one. Most of us have been affected by the fact we haven't been able to see loved ones over this pandemic. Do you think that's given greater awareness to the situation of children in institutions? I would hope so. But what we see is that, unfortunately, the, the last few months have created, uh, have brought so much anxiety 
and and what we've seen is that people have, have grown increasingly grown more and more self-absorbed by their own problems and and it's a fact i will not say anything i will not say something else it's, it's what we see in the countries where we operate the issues of, of children in institutions very vulnerable families has been even more marginalized so basically the kind of support we've got from from partners like you is in is 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 so much more important now than it used to be and from now on because of what it offers us. It offers us the possibility to give attention to those who, who lack it more than ever. And linked to that, there's another question about finance. And obviously your demands for your work and the, and the amount you have to do has increased dramatically over the pandemic. But how are you coping with finding the money to be able to fund your programs when there's been a hit on funding to international development projects? Um, it's uh, one of the strongest challenges for us as an organization, um, because uh, as you very well know, most of the effort and focus in terms of giving is going towards uh, the medical field, towards uh, masks and uh, anti-COVID-19 uh, measures. So basically organizations like ours, charities like ours, have had quite significantly to suffer uh, and, and we have to fight more than we used to, to get the funding we need to, to run our programs. I'm hoping that other funders are being as supportive as we are and keeping the, the, the funding going because obviously your work has never been more critical. Sure. Um, so quite a practical question here for you, Stefan. Have some countries been more affected by COVID than others? Yes, those where there is um, less structure uh, and less uh, good governance in terms of administration, either those or those which are simply so, with, with so high populations that it becomes uncontrollable. So I think that we've seen really, really uh, harsh effects of the COVID-19 pandemics, especially in India and Nepal. Uh, we've seen very high uh, consequences in South Africa as well. So in a way, uh, where the Allen and Overy presence has been more prominent, uh, the consequences of the COVID-19 have been also more challenging for, for those particular nations. In, in other areas, we see them quite strongly in Bosnia and Herzegovina. And, uh, um, I, I would say that it's, it's, there are also some areas where we do not know exactly such as Transnistria because it's more of an opaque uh, regime and, and you do not know exactly if, if what they tell you in terms of statistics is actually what there is in the country. So it's a wide, it's, it's a wide variety of, of nuances you have to, to see through to actually have a, a, a clearer image. Thank you. Um, and a question for you, Kyle, actually. Um, obviously, we were privileged enough to be able to visit the work of Hope and Homes for Children. I've been lucky to see it in several countries, which really brings it to life, demonstrates how important their work is. And as you beautifully described, Kyle, explains why there's the hope in their name of Hope and Homes for Children. Um, how, but there's still loads of people I bump into, even at A&O, and when we've been partnering with Hope and Homes for, you know, coming up to two years, that still don't get why their work is so important. Carl, what do you think we as individuals on this call and therefore advocates for Hope and Homes and deinstitutionalization can do to make more people aware of the imp how important this work is? Um, good question, Kate. Um, <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I, I, I mean, it's something I've, I've sort of, yeah, wrestled with a, a bit because for me, the, the real sort of light bulb moment was see, seeing the like very stark contrast um, in the sort of before and after almost of the institution versus the, the family home. And I think it can be challenging for those, you know, within the, the organization when I've been sort of sharing my experiences with those at A&O to, to really convey um, both the, the sort of before state and the sort of levels of poverty that Stefan's describing and that we had um, we had visited and the, the level of sort of challenge and just unbelievable hardship um, to people that frankly have been living a life of privilege, right? I mean, the, the reality is that, that I and most of my colleagues um, live a very comfortable existence um, in a very sheltered world and 
the, the sorts of people that, that Hope and Homes are, are helping, you know, they're, they're facing challenges that, that are just unfamiliar to us and are difficult for us to understand because it's, it's so severe that it's difficult to get your head around it. And it's something that I, I think is, has been quite difficult to convey. I mean, I'm, I'm not the most sort of eloquent uh, lawyer going, but, you know, nevertheless, sort of, I've tried to sort of share that personal experience and more importantly than sort of what I saw, how I felt and to, to try and pass that on. And I think the more that, that sort of those involved can do that and share the sort of the impact, the sort of personal impact on them of, of seeing the, the work that's going on, I think that the more likely we are to sort of build a bridge that people can can truly appreciate. Sorry, that wasn't a particularly uh, well constructed answer, but um, it, it is a difficult uh, difficult um, sort of problem to solve, I suppose. Yeah, I guess we just have to keep going. Yeah, it's challenging. Um, and and Stefan, a question for you. Right at the beginning of the pandemic, we actually ran a workshop um, for a lot of our charity partners on coping with lockdown. And the, the lady who ran it said that she'd done some research and found that people in the charity sector were suffering from kind of um, grief and guilt because they felt they couldn't get to the people they wanted to help um, right. because they physically couldn't get there yeah. obviously this has been incredibly challenging i've met a lot of your staff who as you said yourself incredibly dedicated um how have how have you been keeping them strong both kind of mentally and you, you taught that physically sadly some of them have been poorly but how have you kept them strong and motivated in such a challenging time the motivation came from itself um and uh, the ambition to be out there uh, came from the challenges and from the hardships our colleagues saw uh, in those we we worked with so the motivation was not an issue what was an issue was to see how these people are left aside um, their problems are mostly ignored so i think that it became more evident for us that in the absence of charities non-governmental organizations their voice is simply not heard they are a sort of an um, uh, ignored mass of people and they are in the scale of millions, tens of millions, and it's increasing. Um, it's a testament of the fact that currently in society, what we see is a lack of empathy. It's, it's growing, a growing phenomenon that of not being able to put yourself into somebody else's shoes, uh, but actually just, just mind the, the problems we have. Uh, so I think this is what, what gave even more ambition to, to us and to our staff to make sure that the hardships of, of uh, those we work with are heard and answered to, to as much uh, a level as possible. Hopefully down the line there's a, a good holiday for everyone where they can actually try and relax. Um, okay, another question that's just come in. Um, da, 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 da. So a question about to what extent your regional advocacy had suffered um and can you give more examples of how that advocacy work is continuing and then a very practical question about um someone saying that a family group of 12 children was accept acceptable if you can confirm that that would be great yes i would say that for us uh, uh, the family type home if, if this is a question i suppose about family type homes we have a maximum uh, allowance of 12 children per family type home um of course ideally we would have less um and um, they work, what we see is that having family type homes for 12 children with about the same number of members of staff, uh, 10 to 12 or 13 members of staff, works better because each child has a, a key members, member of staff. So basically what we do is we see that a, a child has a significant adult in his or her life. And this is essential for a child's development. So in this respect, having a, a group of 12 is, is, is okay, it's definitely uh, a huge step uh, or, or a huge difference from what institutionalization looks like for that particular child. This is in, in, in respect of, uh, of the question related to, to the group of 12. And what was the other question, sorry Kate? About your regional advocacy work and how... Oh yes, yeah. the regional advocacy work has, has received more of a boost now than ever. Um, so if, if our colleagues in the advocacy team ever felt like their presence was useful, now it was the time. 
because everything they did was try to make these messages as much as, as visible, uh, as visible as possible, as uh, uh, noticeable as possible. So they went to the authorities they knew they were supposed to go to with, with these messages related to, to children, families, institutions. We did it at, at a, a multitude of, of levels, not only internationally, UN, EU, uh, but also in terms of uh, governments, regional authorities, county councils, local authorities, uh, town halls. Uh, so basically they tried to ensure that we reach as many layers of uh, exposure and as many types of audiences as possible, especially those which have a decision-making power. Fabulous. And um, I'm going to sneak in one more question, if we can kind of answer it as quickly as possible. These two yeah. are kind of slightly connected, is how we make sure that um, deinstitutionalization is part of building back better and how we're ensuring that orphanages are not the answer in the recovery of the pandemic. Just by underlining as much as possible, as much as we can, the consequences of institutionalization, the, the effects of institutionalization upon child development, because they are disastrous. Just by making as much as possible known the fact that institutionalization is, in our view, a form of, of, of state terror. And it, you know, just because of the huge abuse it sends and it, it brings upon children and child development, that's how. By showing the huge difference in terms of positiveness between family environments in comparison to the traumatic consequences of institutionalization upon children. Fabulous, thank you. Well, there are a couple more questions which I'm afraid we haven't got time to answer. Um, but I just want to wrap up and just give a huge, huge thanks to Stefan and Kyle and Isabel as well. Um, I wish we could be catching up and seeing each other in person, but let's hope that 2021 will give us that, that opportunity. And Stefan, please pass on um, all our best wishes to all of your staff and thank them for their continued dedication um, to your work. So thank you for that. Thank you, Mayor. Just say thank you, Alina Novri, for what you do. Because <laughs> your support is definitely going where it needs to go. And, and it reaches so many children and, and uh, families who otherwise would be left stuck. Well, it's been a fabulous partnership and we're delighted that it's going to continue into July next year. And so we can really get as much out of it as possible before we have to sadly say goodbye. But you've been a great partner to work with. So thank you. Um, if you do have any further questions and do get in contact with Kate Wellsby, um, I think she'd probably put her email address up. And, oh, there you go. In the chat box already. So organized. Um, so that um, concludes our, our webinar series. They are available um, on the Hope and Homes for Children's YouTube channel. Um, if you have any questions about that, again, email Kate, she's in charge and can um, share those with you. Um, but just want to thank Hope and Homes for Children for organising these, um, everyone who has participated um, and everyone who's come along to, to listen. I've certainly um, learned a lot and feel even more passionate about um, the work of Hope and Homes for Children and the need for deinstitutionalisation, and I'm sure you all do too. So, Thank you, everyone, and hopefully see some of you in real life in 2021. Also, Thank you.